Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ravina, for that um, lovely introduction, and thanks to uh, Madhavi and all the staff here for organizing this visit, and all of you for coming. It's an honor to be here. Um, the title I realized as I was looking through the slides is a bit uh, misleading in one respect, and that's the word after. I'm not actually going to say much about what has happened in New York after Sandy. Uh, I'm really going to talk about what happened in New York before Sandy and during it, as uh, the years before, during the storm, and the few days after. And then I'm going to talk about Mumbai, the future of urban flooding. This part is about this city, which in some respects is the way New York was in the past, in the sense that we hadn't had a disaster yet of the type that I'm going to describe. But it was, we knew it was possible, and the same is true here. Um, so uh, let's see. I, this should change the slides, right? Yeah, yeah I just did that. Uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so this is um, just to show you what Hurricane Sandy was, because I'm going to talk a bit about it. Hurricane Sandy happened in 2012, uh, October 2012. This was the track. It started down here in the uh, Caribbean, came up, did a lot of damage uh, here in Cuba and Jamaica, Haiti, went through the Bahamas, and then uh, coming up made this sharp left turn which was uh, extremely unusual, it hadn't happened before that a storm had done that in our region, and made landfall as a, a storm which was not uh, actually a very powerful storm in the sense that we usually measure them. In other words, the maximum winds were not that strong, but it was extremely large, and because of the size of it, as well as the angle that it came in, uh, it caused a huge storm surge. And the storm surge, we're being asked people know what storm surge is. Storm surges, causes flooding, but not because of rain. It's when the wind pushes the ocean onto the land. So it, so you have the tide, which is the water's naturally going up and down. Then the wind comes and raises the water level up. And that's what was the problem in Sandy. Nine feet, uh, or two and a half meters of storm surge in New York Harbor. On top of it, it, we had the misfortune that that occurred almost precisely at high tide, which was about five feet above the low tide. Your tides here, by the way, are much larger uh, than ours. But at any rate, um, the net result was flooding of a lot of the city. Okay, uh, and all the consequences from that, which I'll give you just a short summary of. Uh, the storm was forecast very well. Uh, we had good warning. This was um, the Her National Hurricane Center forecast, our, our US forecast agency, uh, from five days before landfall. So this was the position of the storm at that time, and this was the forecast track. This so-called cone of uncertainty gives some idea of the uncertainty. So there, you know, at five days lead time, it could be the center could be anywhere in here. But in fact, this forecast track was almost precisely what happened. If you compare this, this is what really happened exactly. You see this coming up, going here, making this left hook, and coming in right here. This is the state of southern New Jersey. Look at this; it's almost precisely the same thing. So very good forecast five days ahead of time. In fact, there was some even earlier than that. There were forecasts, but NHC goes out to five days. And as the and this was, this was actually the forecast five days before. I mean, I took this off the internet at that time. But in the days subsequent, it didn't change. It was very consistent. So that everybody knew pretty well what was going to happen, even though there were some issues with communicating it, which I won't get into uh, 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 now, because they're not really relevant here. But at any rate, the forecast was good. And as a consequence of that, uh, our state and local and federal governments had a chance to prepare. And these are the things that they did. As of 24, about a day before Sandy hit, this is um, some of the things, and I'm going to focus here on New York City. Sandy had big impacts all up and down um, from southern New Jersey, all up through New England, but I'm going to focus on New York City. Uh, there were evacuations ordered, mandatory evacuations of Zone A, which is the lowest, you know, the places that are most flood prone, the lowest lying neighborhoods. There's about 370,000 people uh, live in Zone A, so they were ordered to evacuate. Uh, the one decision which in hindsight was a bad decision was that nursing homes and adult care facilities were not evacuated, even if they were in Zone A, and the thinking was it would be hard to move them, um, but in fact it would be better to do it after the storm, but after the storm the power was out and the transportation wasn't working. So that turned out to be a bad decision. I could talk a lot more about it, but it's easier to see these things after the fact. The transit system, the subways and buses were shut down about 24 hours before landfall. So the idea was, first of all, you don't want any people. You know, our, just like you're building a metro here, we have a metro, it's all underground. You don't want people, the, the, the openings, however, open to the air, so it was known that these were likely to fill up with water. So you don't want people to be in there, uh, and you close down the roads going, and the bridges going across all of our, um, 
our, our waterways. Uh, and also the, the subway cars themselves were moved out of the way so they wouldn't be damaged. There were some attempts to protect the infrastructure. So the, 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 I'm focused on the subways because the subway system is what makes New York go. If you've ever been there, you know the city just doesn't work without the subways. And so um, I'd like to talk about that. So that all these openings were known that they might flood. So the MTA, which is our local transit agency, went and hammered plywood over all these openings. That was the best they could do at short notice. It did not work uh, by and large. Water got through that, um, but that was the best they could do at the time. Uh, one thing they did do, they, the engineers went through the tunnels and pulled out all the electrical signal equipment that they could so that when it filled up with water, that stuff would not be damaged. And then afterwards, when they pumped out the water, they could put that stuff back. And uh, as a consequence, they were able to get the subways running again within about a week after landfall, whereas the estimates are that it would have taken more like a month had they not done that. That was a very successful thing. Uh, our power uh, authority, Con Edison, knew that some of their trans, uh, transformers, some of their substations that through which all the power runs were going to flood. And so they turned those off before the storm hit so that there wouldn't be current running through and all the stuff wouldn't short out. There were other ones that they didn't <coughs> turn off, that they didn't think would flood because they had walls around them, which turned out not to be high enough, and they did flood. You might have seen the videos where these, uh, you can see from across these river, these uh, substations look blowing up as a consequence of a lot of the city lost power for many days. Um, FEMA, which is our federal agency that deals with disasters, had been getting ready for several days, moving people, food and water and everything. So these were the things that happened. Just to summarize, then the, so then the storm hits, there's flooding. Um, I'll show you a map of what, where it was flooded in a moment, but this is a quick summary of the impact uh, in terms of numbers. There were, according to this Center for Disease Control, 117 deaths in the United States. Many of those were in New York City and the surrounding area. That's, of course, terrible for the people who were killed. It is, however, a very low number, considering how extensive was the flooding. Uh, this, I, this is a success, I mean, to, that the number was as low as it was. Many of these people were people who were ordered to evacuate and did not, uh, for, for various reasons. There are probably more people who were killed indirectly, such as the people in nursing homes, who didn't die right away in the flooding, but then had to be moved in difficult circumstances. And, you know, so it's hard to actually count how many people were killed in a disaster. But anyway, so this number is probably a little bit low, but lower than it should be. But at any rate, the economic damage totally was estimated by different people at between 50 to 65 billion US dollars, uh, including both direct damage and lost business. Just a few pictures. This is um, uh, in, in Mantelope, New Jersey. This is Barrier Island. So it's the Jersey Shore here has a very thin island along it that are basically just sandbars that have been, you know, have homes on them. The water broke right through and washed away these. You know, some of these are very expensive um, beach homes. Similar things happened in the Barrier Islands along New York, which I'll show you a map uh, in a moment. Um, flooding of all kinds of facilities. This is a pass station that. It's a commuter train that runs from Hoboken is in New Jersey on the other side of the Hudson River. So this flooded, um, you know, it's underground. Uh, the power outages, this is um, you know, half of Manhattan. This was about 39th Street, if you know Manhattan, something like that. About half dark for landfall was on a Monday night. Uh, it was dark until sometime around Friday or Saturday, except for this battery park complex, which has its own power system. Uh, but this was a result of these substations out here uh, shorting out. There were several along the East River here. Uh, just for you, geographic, this is the Hudson, this is the East River, this is Lower Manhattan, this is the North is that way. Okay. Um, this is a map of where the flooding was, uh, just in the just in New York City in the five boroughs. So this is New Jersey here. This is all New Jersey. Uh, this is Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and Bronx, and everything that's blue was underwater by the number of feet shown in the colors. The point I want to make here, this is all the lowest lying parts of the city, and all of them historically pretty much were one of three types of land. Well, some of it is floodplain here, like this uh, Newtown Creek is a, is, a, you know, is a little river. But the Rockaways here, this is Barrier Island, just like the Jersey Shore, it's basically sandbar that's been built on. Jamaica Bay here and these neighborhoods in Staten Island which were totally devastated. These are historically wetland. Some of them still are wetland, but it's wetland that's been developed. Like here it would be mangrove, but you know, we're too cold, we don't have mangroves, but uh, swamp, you know. And then here, like in Lower Manhattan, landfill. So in South Street Seaport, if you've ever been there, is, is, is here. The water there came a couple of blocks in from the what is now the coast up to a street that's called Water Street. 
and it's called Water Street because it's where the coast used to be until the Dutch and the English land filled out. So that's basically everything that flooded was of these three types, more or less. So it's been places that we sort of should have known were flood prone, but this was a very rare event, as I'll show you, and the real estate's very valuable, and it's all, you know, it did develop. Um, okay, now I've lost my slides again. Is there something here to keeping this going? No, no. Thanks. This is, uh, I'd like to talk about this one. This is the South Ferry Station. Um, it's a subway station at the end of the number one line, which is the line. If you go to Columbia University, where I work, uh, it's the subway that you take to get there. And then if you go all the way south to the end of Manhattan, this is where you get off. It's where you also get the ferry to go to Staten Island. And this is the station there. Uh, it was a new station that had been built, just opened in 2012. So just months before Sandy, the city opens a new subway station, replacing the old one that was there cost about uh, 550 million US dollars, no flood protection, although it's in a flood zone, totally fills up with water, and it's essentially, the, the cost to, to fix it, which it's still not fixed uh, now, five years later, the cost to fix it is estimated at 600 million dollars. So it's, it's total, like, you know, you, the cost to fix it is the cost you pay to build it. So I, want, I like to talk about this example because this is a case where you can ask, you know, you can say the subway system as a whole in New York City is over 100 years old. So it was built a long time ago. We didn't completely understand the risks. You know, that's a good excuse for the thing being vulnerable. But in this case, this was opened in 2012. This was new infrastructure. So you could say we should have known better. And why didn't we? And we did. Uh, this is a report that was put out in 1995 um, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the, the FEMA, which is our disa uh, federal disaster agency, the Weather Service, and local emergency managers. And it's uh, called Metro New York Hurricane Transportation Study. It was an in-detail study about what to do in the case of a severe hurricane in the New York City metro area, which is a, a complicated, uh, very crowded place, a lot like Mumbai in many ways. You have many, many people coming into a, a, a relatively small, crowded area every day and then going out again through a congested transit system, going over bridges and through tunnels. And you know, the question is, if you have a serious storm, how do you get people out of harm's way in this complicated environment? That's what this report was meant to study. And the, um, the, the Weather Service, the Hurricane Center, uh, which is part of the Weather Service, did a study where they, they knew storm surge was the risk in New York City, that we're not going to get the super strong cyclone that's going to blow down buildings. It's the flooding that, uh, due to storm surge, that's the problem for low lying areas. So they did simulations of what could happen uh, in a sort of worst case scenario or medium worst case scenario. And then they figured out how high could the water get. And they put that on top of maps of transit facilities to figure out which key transit facilities would flood. And here's the old South Perry Station, uh, which is in the same place as the new one. And this is a line that they drew of how high the water could get. This is my arrow, but this line is in the original report. So about to a little, almost 20 years before Sandy, this was exactly predicted that this particular facility would flood. And then, you know, 18 years later, the MTA builds uh, a new station in exactly the same place and totally ignores this prediction. Um, so, so, I mean, we can talk, and then, and then this was in 1995. Later, there were more reports. Uh, I mean, the city, to its credit, and the state were studying this issue carefully. It just didn't take action in that case. But this was a report that came out uh, years later. There were a few in between. Some these are my colleagues at Columbia that did this work, Klaus Jacob uh, at Lamont uh, and George Diodatus in the engineering school, that, that mapped in even more detail. I won't explain this, but they mapped in great detail exactly how which subway tunnels would fill up with water, how quickly, and by how much. And all this, they thought this was going to happen in like you know, 100 years after some sea level rise or something, they didn't expect it to happen right away. But nonetheless, what they predicted happened almost exactly in Sandy, so it was uh, quite remarkable. So that all this was known, um, but, and, and the purpose of this report was, was two things, and one was successful and one was not. So this is, uh, this is my summary. So for at least 20 years before Sandy happened, the city, state, and local governments have been doing these reports. They've been asking scientists, and engineers and planners and emergency managers sit down and figure out what were the um, risks of, of you know what could happen in a in a uh, in a storm. These reports recommended two things: one, uh, long-term measures to storm-proof infrastructure. In other words, if you uh, you could build you know flood walls, you could elevate roads, you could do different things to make it more um, infrastructure more resilient. The other thing is learn how to do short-term emergency management. And they were recommendations like start the things which were actually done in the event, like start the evacuations one day before, 
close the transit system one day before because it takes time to get people out of harm's way, et cetera. So the, so the infrastructure net measures didn't happen. In other words, the infrastructure was left vulnerable, and the recommendations of these reports were not implemented, although a lot of them are being implemented now because the disaster has happened. And that's a typical pattern of human societies. All the serious disaster prevention engineering measures that you see, like in the Netherlands, the giant barriers, all those are built after disasters. Nobody ever acts before, uh, pretty much. But the emergency management planning did happen. So the state, local, and federal governments had read these reports, and when the storm actually came, they knew more or less what to do. They didn't have to figure it out at the moment. There had been scientific studies, they absorbed those, and so these measures that saved lives and property to some good extent, closing the transit system, getting people out of the way, all that, um, you know, that was successful, okay? Um, so now I want to talk about Mumbai. That's my quick summary of, um, of New York. Now I want to say, what of, what of this is relevant to Mumbai? And this is a study that Ravina introduced, we've been doing here at the Global Center, as well as you know, doing our research back home in New York, and it's with my colleagues, Susanna Camargo at Lamont. Uh, Jiang Li has done the uh, hurricane modeling work, lead on hurricane modeling work. She's at an institute called the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. Kyle Manley and Mike Tippett at the Engineering School. Zachary Bird is here and is a, a postdoctoral scientist in the School of Public Health who's spending um, uh, approximately a year here in Mumbai studying the potential economic and public health impacts of cyclones. So some of you may, may uh, you know, wish to talk with him. And our colleague, Kerry Manuel at MIT, who's uh, arguably, I think, the best hurricane expert in the world, has, has worked on uh, this as well. And I'll show what his, um, what his contribution is in a moment. So and where I got this idea, Rubina said I would tell the story. And this is the story. So I, I, I wrote this book about Sandy and um, then about a year later, I got an email from this rather famous uh, fellow, Amitav Ghosh, great um, fiction writer and nonfiction writer. And he wrote to me and said, I came up on Storage a while ago and I read it. Uh, he had some nice things to say about the book, which is very flattering because you know, he's a great writer and I'm not. Um, but he says, I'm currently working on a couple of projects. He's in global warming and impacts on India. And he wanted to talk about cyclones. And what he, one of the things, so he came to my apartment in New York because he lives half the year in New York, the other half in, uh, in Goa. Um, and uh, he said, could this happen in Mumbai? What happened to New York and Sandy, could it happen here? And he knew that uh, Mumbai is very vulnerable because it's so right by the sea, very low lying, very, you know, a lot of it is quite flat. And so if the same thing were to happen, the flooding would be quite awful. And he asked me, could this happen? And that's what started this study. He ended up uh, writing this book. It's about climate change, history, and culture, the great derangement. And he says a little bit about this in, uh, in the book. It's a great book, I highly recommend. But anyway, this got us started on the study. Then we found out there's a uh, Columbia Global Center here, and, and we started researching precisely this question. Um, the first thing I uh, did when I started researching this was just to Google to see if it had happened before. Has uh, been hit by a cyclone, a major cyclone, you know, one that would really cause damage in its history. And if you do that, uh, you can, you know, if you want to do it, you can do it right now on your phone, and you will find out that there was a cyclone in Bombay in 1882 that killed approximately 100,000 people. It turns out this is not true. Um, I, I will spare you the details, but if you go to Wikipedia right now, you will see it there. In list, I promise you, it's still there. It's in the list of the 10 deadliest tropical cyclones in history. The rest of them, I believe, are real, as far as I know. But this one uh, turns out to be there's no actual historical documentation of it. And at, in 1882, actually, the weather here was being measured quite well. Uh, and there's no way you could kill 100,000 people, which would have been about one eighth of the city's population at that time, without it being in history books, and it is not in history books. So I'll spare you the details, but we researched it. Uh, this fellow, um, Dr. Mukhopadhyay at, uh, at IIT Pune, helped us looking at the old archives of um, the IMD, and it's false. So as far as we know, it has not happened in the modern history of the city that a major site, there have been a few weak site moments, I'll show you, including the one last week, but there hasn't been a major one of the type that we're concerned about in this project that would really cause damage. Um, there have been floods, of course, as you all know. Uh, there have been floods due to rain, which is a different phenomenon. Uh, um, the big one in 2005, which is this uh, picture, and, the, and another one this year, uh, as you all uh, are aware. But uh, uh, these are, this is rain events. Uh, a storm surge includes, uh, caused by a severe cyclone could have a different pattern of flooding and possibly a significantly worse one, and that's what our concern is. Um, Mumbai is, has even more vulnerable to New York than New York in the sense that it's flatter and more of it is 
reclaimed land. So this is, you know, historically, it's just a bunch of uh, flat, more or less, there are a few hills, but more or less flat islands and then were landfilled in to form a, you know, the places that we're sitting now. Um, and so that's what makes it so vulnerable to you know, uh, rapidly rising sea levels as in a storm surge. Um, this is just a, uh, I, I, I'm not going to tell you the details of how we produce this, but this is a very preliminary, not final, uh, estimate of how high water could get in a severe cyclone. I think it's overly optimistic for the south for reasons that I won't, uh, I think the south could be, anywhere you see that sort of red, it's where in the sea the water is higher than normal by this number of meters. Where you see the white, it's areas um, on land that are flooded. And I think it's overly optimistic for the peninsula here, but uh, I think it could be worse than this. And particularly, this doesn't account for the tide. So if it hit a high tide, just add two meters right away. Also, I think our topographic data for, for the south is um, overestimates the height of the land. But at any rate, what we do believe is that all, a lot of this area here along Donna Creek and on the east side, uh, a lot of which is mangrove now, some of which is slated for development. There's a new airport being planned over here, new port, and new bridges, and all that stuff. A lot of that is vulnerable in a cyclone. Which, I mean, just the, if there's mangroves there, you know it's flood prone, right? That's where the mangroves live. Um, so that's one clue. But this is our, you know, our preliminary uh, estimate of, a, of a one scenario. Um, now a bit about cyclones. So there are, as you probably know, there are not very many of them in the Arabian Sea. The, the North Indian Ocean as a whole has not that many. And of the ones in the North Indian Ocean, most of them are in the Bay of Bengal. So the Arabian Sea is relatively quiet, but they do happen here. The average historically is about one or two per year. These are the tracks since the advent of satellite data. The IMD has, has data going back much earlier to the late 19th century, which is probably not as accurate as in this era where we have satellites. So I'm just showing you the satellite era. Um, this is all the storms since 1979 up to 2015. Color coded by intensity, so the green are just what we call depressions. Those are weak ones. Tropical storm. This is using the U.S. scale. Sorry, tropical storm is somewhat stronger. Means winds up to 35 knots, or um, uh, about half that a meter per second. Red is what we would call a hurricane in in uh, in U.S. Uh, language. It's a um, cyclonic storm. It's here in the hurricane. I believe it's. I'm going to get it wrong if I tell you this here. Cyclonic storm, severe cyclonic storm. Anyway, uh, 65 knot winds at least um, uh, is category one. And so red is, and, and magenta are higher than that. And what you see if you look at this is that most of them go west. If they form somewhere around here, they go west, or they go northwest, or they go north. A couple have come near Mumbai. There was one in 2009. But those are weak. The blue and green are weak ones. Um, Aki is not on here these days. But you see a couple of red ones coming up in Gujarat. In fact, uh, there have been since 19, since the 70s, four or five uh, intense cyclones have struck Gujarat. This is a couple of them. One in 1998 that is estimated to, to kill over a thousand people and done 290 million dollars U.S. in damage. Uh, this is one in uh, 1975 that has a nice uh, paper about it by Professor Dubey, formerly of IIT Delhi. And there are a few more. Um, uh, most of which happened in the pre-monsoon season, May or June, uh, but the 1982 one happened in November. And that's interesting for a reason I'll get to in a little, you know, in, in a little bit later. Um, so, so what we see is, to summarize, these tracks tend to go either west or they go north. They don't tend to take a right turn in this region. You see sort of, there's sort of a gap in the tracks over here along the coast, so making Mumbai seem safe. But, you know, our experience in New York tells us not to be complacent. Right? These, these are all the historical tracks of hurricanes reaching at least category one, 65 knots, that have come close to the New Jersey coastline. This is a study that a NASA colleague and I did right after Sandy. So this is the New Jersey coastline marked in blue. Um, these are all those previous storm tracks. And you can see they all come north and they don't turn left. And left is the bad angle for New York Harbor because the winds are blowing around in a circle like this. So coming in at this angle, the winds are being superimposed on the motion of the storm itself, and you get the wind pushing into New York Harbor here, which is otherwise quite protected. So this angle was part of the reason why the storm surge was so bad. The other reason was that the storm was very big, so the winds were blowing over a very large fetch, as you say. But, um, so this, this track had never happened before. So if, you know, if 
Before 2012, you would have looked at this map and said, well, they all go north. They don't make that left turn, but then one did. So the point is, you know, you shouldn't, just because this hasn't happened before doesn't mean that it won't happen. And of course, as was mentioned, just as I was packing for my flight to come here, uh, look what I see in the forecast. And um, in fact, this, for, uh, this was Cyclone Aki forecast by the IMB. This was issued, I think, around December 3 or so. So this was the actual track up to that point. This was the forecast and a cone of uncertainty saying that it could, in fact, if, uh, you know, this means the center could lie anywhere within here. So there was some possibility of it hitting directly on Mumbai. It was forecast to weaken. So I, we knew it probably wouldn't be a really major disaster of the type that I'm worrying about. But nonetheless, the timing was truly spooky because this is the time that my flight was supposed to get in and the track of the storm was putting it right here. So like, you know, I've come here twice in my life and the purpose was to study a cyclone which almost never happens and the night I'm supposed to get here, the cyclone is there. And so I, I mean, there's no science here, I just have to tell you the story because it was truly unbelievable. Anyway, it turned out to fizzle and the flight got to find it was no problem. But at any rate, um, it shows anyway that, that that right turn is, you know, can happen even though in this case the cyclone weakened. Had the wind shear, had the meteorological conditions been a little bit different, it is possible that it could have maintained its strength to a greater extent. Okay, um, so it hasn't happened in modern times, but the history is short, I and mean, we only have really good data going back to the, well, we only have really good data going back about to the late 1970s. We only have reasonable data going back to the late 19th century. That's not a long time, really, in the space of, you know, geologic time, and so we can't just count. Uh, you know, history. We can't just estimate what the probability is by just counting the number of times that it happened. And this is typical of disaster risk assessment. So it's a fact uh, known by you know disaster scholars that if you look at the damage from disasters over time, globally or in any one place, and you say over the long period of history, where do, what are the disaster? Where does most of the damage come from? And it's a few big events that cause most of the damage. Like one big one is worth a lot of small ones, but those big ones are very rare. Uh, making it hard to assess the risk of historical data. So this is a graph that shows different hurricanes causing deep storm surges in New York Harbor. So, you know, it, it's not even these space and time. But here's the dates. We have good data from about here, from tide gauge in New York Harbor. So how high did the water get above the average tide? So we have a lot of events around a meter and a half. Here's Sandy. Um, uh, this is, sorry, this is the tide plus the surge. Uh, so it's a uh, Three and a half meters, according to that metric, it includes the includes the high tide as part of it. So we have a lot of events around a meter and a half, and then one at three and a half meters, more than twice as much, and then nothing back until 1821. <laughs> 1821, the city had 150,000 people instead of the 8 million it has today. There was no power to go out. There was no subways to flood. But you know, we know it happened, even though the error bar, this is the uncertainty, is is you know quite large. But uh, we know that it happened. But still, you you couldn't really look at the history and get a really accurate estimate of how likely this is to happen. You just don't have enough data. You, want to, you don't want to have thousands of years of data to count how many times this happened. This is a typical problem. So what we do um, to, to deal with this, and this is uh, really the insurance industry that has pioneered this methodology, although now a number of us in academia have become interested in it, is we use what are called catastrophe models. We generate synthetic histories. We develop ways of doing it, and I won't get into the details, but of generating artificial data sets that extend history by generating lots of synthetic storms that are somehow similar to the real ones, but enable us to extend the history so that we can count the rare events that haven't happened. So one of these is the map of all the hurricane tracks in the Atlantic since 1851, and the others are synthetic records from a model by my colleague here, Tim Hall at NASA. And you can see that they kind of look like each other. So that's one example. We have developed our own model. This is a big part of what we were doing as part of this uh, project here with the Global Center was getting this model working so that we could do this, although it's global. So this is historically all the storm tracks over some period of years, color-coded by intensity, which means wind, the strength of the wind. So the red ones are very are the strongest, etc. And this is a model we've just generated, which generates synthetic histories. And you can see that it's not exactly right. There's too many here that aren't really here. The Atlantic, they go a bit too far north, um, etc. But you know. In the big picture, it looks uh, pretty reasonable, and we have various ways of trying to correct the deficiencies. And from this, we can estimate the ch uh, chance of a storm surge to Mumbai. I'm going to now show you just a couple of uh, hardcore science results, as, as Rafina was saying. From our model that I just showed you a picture of, uh, my colleague Jai Lee has just submitted the manuscript for publication describing this, as well as Carrie Emanuel, a uh, great hurricane expert and one of my teachers, who really uh, pioneered doing this approach in a way that can account for climate change. 
and he developed his model 10 years ago. We were inspired by him to make another one so that there would be more than one, because when you have one model and it's doing a prediction of the future, you don't know if it's right, so you want to do a different model and see if you can do different answers. So that's what we do that. So and all, both our model and his take, they need to know what the climate is, and then they can say something about what the cyclones could be, so that we can, and that's important because we want to be able to account for climate change. But what I'm going to show you, we're not accounting for climate change yet, so we're going to give you an assessment of cyclone risk from Mumbai in the historical climate, the recent historical climate. Um, so this is some of uh, Emmanuel's data. This is uh, his 32 worst synthetic tracks for Mumbai in 20,000 simulated years. So you wait 20,000 years, you get, these are the 32 worst storms. And you can see some of them, this is the same color coding, some of them are magenta, which means the most powerful storms you can have. Winds over 100 knots, um, you know, would be category, they would be called major hurricanes in the Atlantic. Uh, very, very rare in the Arabian Sea, but it can happen. Um, and so this is all the ones that, the worst ones that come within 150 kilometers of, of Mumbai. So there's, one of these was uh, produced, the, used by my colleague Kyle Manley to produce the flooding map that I showed you before, one of the worst ones, uh, you know, one of these pink ones. This now is a summary of that, those results from manual plus our results from our model. And what's shown here, this is the most hard science data plot I'm going to show you. This is a map of wind speed, intensity, and knots. And I can't convert it to kilometers per hour. I think to get kilometers per hour, it's something like double that. Uh, I can tell you in meters per second, it's about half. So 100 knots is about 50 meters per second. I think in, in, in miles per hour, in, oh no, I can do it. In miles per hour, 100 would be like 110. So 110 miles is like, what, 150, 160 kilometers. So this is like 160 kilometers per hour, okay? And this says that the chance of getting that in a given year, this is the return period. So it's, we say, is it a 100-year storm? Is it a 500-year storm? So this is that, which, which what it really means is that the probability in a single year is one divided by this number. So if it's a 1,000-year storm, then the chance of having it in any given year is a tenth of a percent, one one thousand. So this says that a 100-knot storm, which we would call a major hurricane, threshold for a major hurricane in the US, is about a, you know, and this is our model. This is Emmanuel's model. You can see that they disagree somewhat. His probabilities are a little higher than ours. But, you know, 100 knots is a few hundred year event, maybe 200, maybe 500, 600. Rare, you know, unlikely in any given year, but not impossible. And my colleague Jayane produced this, uh, these results. A storm like this, if it were to come in uh, close to the city at, at a, you know, a, a bad angle or um, <coughs> from a number of different angles, could produce a large storm surge of the type that if it also occurred anywhere close to high tide, could produce a lot of flooding in a lot of the city, including right here, by the way. Of course, I believe we're on reclaimed net land right now, if I'm not mistaken, quite a little bit to see. Um, and just to say a few words about climate change, uh, our study thus far has not dealt with climate change. That is the next thing we want to do. Our model theory can do it, but we have to there are a few technical problems we have to solve. But a study recently was called, there have been a few of the Arabian Sea in climate change. Very few cyclones in, this, in the Arabian Sea have been studied rather little by scientists, perhaps because there's very few of them. Um, but this is a study that recently came out by uh, my colleagues at Princeton uh, and, and the National Ocean Atlantic and Atmospheric Administration um, using what's arguably one of the best global climate models that also resolves hurricanes. And what they're showing here is the frequent, I won't give you the details, but the colors show something like the frequency of very severe cyclones forming in the Arabian Sea for simulations of 1940, 1990, and 2015. And this is the pre-monsoon season, the monsoon season, when they almost never happen because the wind shear of the monsoon suppresses them. You only get cyclones before and after the monsoon in the North Indian Ocean. And then the post-monsoon. And what you see is that in the post-monsoon season, which is now, right, uh, the, the, the probability of getting this very severe cyclone has increased a lot, according to this model, um, in the Arabian Sea. Which, uh, as far as I know, this is there have been other studies that have suggested this. This is the strongest evidence for it that I'm aware of. And it's very provocative, given that we just had one. So the, and, and the last decade or so has been unusually active for the Arabian Sea, with some years having four or five cyclones instead of the normal one or two, and some of those being intense. Even though they didn't come here, they've gone to Yemen and you know on the other side of the Arabian Sea. But, um, 
nonetheless, this is quite uh, provocative. Um, and sea level rise, of course, is a big problem. Even if the storm, this is about storms becoming more likely, but even if the storms don't become more likely, given a storm, flooding will be worse because of sea level rise. This is um, global mean sea level over the historical period. This is, this is the sort of historical, you know, this is the value of 1990. This is how much it changed over the historical period up to when this paper was written about 2010, uh, rising about 3 million meters per year. These were old projections from about 10 years ago, saying that by 2100 we would have maybe 20 to 50, 10 to 50 centimeters. The more recent IPCC report um, gave us an upper bound one meter by 2100. And there are estimates now that might be as high as two meters by 2100. And 2100, it doesn't stop. I mean, sea level rise is one of the last consequences of climate change. So this would you know, continue. If you think further ahead, coastal cities like Mumbai and New York are in even greater trouble. So that just means that when you have a storm surge, the water's starting from a higher place. So it just you know, gives you worse flooding for the same storm. Uh, this is something like the number of very severe storms in a typical 100 years or something like that. It's some measure of frequency of very severe storms, and I can't remember exactly what their cutoff was for very severe storms. Okay. So the record it came about uh, then more than the longer we no, it's the actual number, so there's no subtraction of the long term. Uh, no, they may be taking our mean, you're right. They may be relative to long term mean, yeah. But, they, but I don't think we get up to this color anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm almost done. Just a couple more things. This is a, this is a, a, a study from a few years ago uh, by a group connected to the World Bank, or at least Talagatis now at the World Bank. I can't remember if he was there yet. And it's considering future flood, exactly what it says, future flood losses of major coastal cities in terms of economic, potential economic losses as a consequence of sea level rise. Considering the typical, um, you know, from possible extreme events, which however were estimated from tide gauge data. And it's important to say that the tide gauge data in Mumbai, since there hasn't been a cyclone here, if you look at tide gauge data, you, you get no, no information about cyclone risk. Nonetheless, Mumbai comes as number five, uh, the fifth most uh, city with, at fifth, in terms of potential economic loss. I mean, part of this is because it's vulnerable and low, part of it because it's tremendous amount of wealth here, right? That's what this is measuring. It's not measuring human fatalities, it's measuring uh, money losses. Of course, there's also human vulnerability here as well. But anyway, it's number five, and uh, I understand that it's projected to move up due to the population growth, you know, uh, all the future. But at any rate, Mumbai is vulnerable to sea level rise, and this is even without accounting for cyclones. There's no cyclone here. The last thing I just want to say is that um, I don't think that cyclone risk here has been historically and even up to the present considered to be as big of uh, a concern as perhaps it should be. I mean, it's a low probability event, but a low probability but very high impact event. And so while I don't think, you know, I as a professor from New York City coming here, I mean, it would be absurd if I were to say, you know, the city should start building walls around itself or something because of something that only has a very, very small chance of happening in a given year, that would be silly. But what's not so silly would be to think, okay, as we did in New York, in New York, where we also didn't build, you know, didn't protect our infrastructure, but we did develop plans for what to do in the event of a storm. That doesn't cost that much. To think through, given what the infrastructure is, you know, uh, to study what the potential damage to the city would be and what is the best way to use the resources you have to move people out of harm's way to protect the infrastructure. And, and if you look at the current disaster management plans, uh, the disaster management plans of the state and of the city that currently exist, they mention cyclones very briefly, uh, and I think it, it, they would warrant a little more in-depth study. There's also very recently a climate change, a vulnerability adaptation plan from the state, which is another, you know, thinking into the future as climate changes, and that doesn't mention cyclones at all. Um, so just to summarize, I, uh, this is my last slide. To first say something about Sandy, it was well forecast. Uh, in terms of the actual you know, uh, weather forecast. And also, though, it was preceded by decades of study on the risk of such an event, what the potential consequences would be. Um, these studies recommended uh, investments in infrastructure to protect them from such an event, and that didn't happen. Uh, 
you know, we weren't that proactive, as almost no place ever is in response to just scientific predictions of possible future disaster. People don't respond until they've actually seen it. Which, by the way, is a terrible problem for climate change, where we are precisely predicting something in the future, you know, that it's happening now, but you know, we're saying it'll be worse in the future and, and it hasn't happened yet. But what was successful, these studies also recommended uh, measures for planning emergency management. Um, and this was more effective. But when, when it happened, city, state, and local, and, and federal government were able to know what to do to take measures to get people out of harm's way and save uh, lives and to some extent to protect the infrastructure. Here in Mumbai, where historically there are not severe cyclones, nonetheless, our best, the best estimates we can make with our current science suggest that there is some risk of a severe cyclone here. Not a wimpy one like Aki or the other ones that have come nearby, but a really severe one could happen here, even though with low probability. Um, and climate change seems to be, as best as we know, increasing that risk, both due to changes in the climate, which make severe storms more likely as well as sea level rise. And so my, you know, my basic message is that planning for emergency management in the event of such a severe cyclone and the storm surge flooding, which could be different, than the 2005 and 2017 uh, uh, rainfall-driven floods would be a good idea here, as it was in New York. So that's all I have. Thank you very much for your